there. My name is Jessica Crow. I'm the founder of Apogee and the host of Change Leader Insights. And I am so excited to have with me today, Dr. Jen Fromm. She's the co-founder of the Agile Change Leadership Institute. She's a three-time author. She's a consultant, a teacher, a trainer, a coach, all of the things. And I'm really happy to have her here with me today because we've connected through um, an association that we both belong to and on LinkedIn. And I'm so impressed with her thought process, her work. And I have no doubt that you are going to learn a lot from her today, as I know I will be. So Jen, can you share a little bit about yourself, kind of how you got into this space, your your origin story, so to speak? <laughs> of course, of course. And thank you so much for having me, Jessica. It's a real joy to be here. And I love the way that we connected and and all of these little serendipitous moments where, yeah. you know, my newsletter used to be the change leader insights. Right. You're it, like, we have yeah. all these things, which uh, is yeah. kind of cool. Parallel yeah. universe. Yeah. Okay. Origin story. Do you know what? And I don't know that I've shared this with anybody else. Oh, um, I'm, this I'm... could be a scoop. This could be a scoop. When we think <laughs> about the origin, because I can tell you when we first, I first started doing change. Okay. But part of my origin is I have a mother who was a very successful science fiction writer okay. and a father who was a serial entre entrepreneur, right, mm -hmm. and was always introducing things. He was introducing solar in the early 80s, so wow. things that were in the future and, you know, and, and when I think about it and I think about the conversations that had happened at my dinner table, from mm -hmm. science fiction to future-focused yeah. entrepreneurship, was there ever any chance that I was not going to work in change? <laughs> yeah, right? right. Good point. <laughs> yeah, good point. That, is, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense for the origin story. <laughs> it does, it does. But I guess, I I, so what, what that meant was that, you know, I think when I first started working in change, I didn't have a formal role in change. I was the mm -hmm. person that in organisations they would come to and they would say, we need your help, you know, introducing um, the fact that we're not using pay slips anymore back back mm -hmm. in the day. So for mm -hmm. those who are listening at the moment, what they'll be missing is that I have six substantial grey hair, silver <laughs> hair, actually. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about 30 years experience in the field at the moment. Um <laughs> And so a lot of the work that I did was informal and I was just naturally the change agent person that, um, you know, the, the leaders would come to to say, yeah. hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do this? Happened for me in 1997 when um, I was a product manager of yep. fleet control of all products uh, in the veterinary industry and uh -huh. the pharmaceutical company was going through a global merger. Yeah, And so at that point I joined the project team and it was at the same time I was studying my undergrad as a part-time student. I was one of those really annoying um, mature age students who really distressed <laughs> the lecturers because, you know, they think they know everything. Right. And, and so at the same time I was studying managing change in my undergrad and all of a sudden I could use everything that I was covering in this project yeah. where we were doing the global merger um, of the pharmaceutical companies and I fell in love with it I just fell yeah. in love with projects with the structure with the art with the delicateness of the conversations you have to have yeah and yeah. so really um dedicated my career to the more formal side um which meant that I did a PhD in the yep. space um and was one of the earliest PhDs in organizational change and communication yeah. um I did do a stint as an academic uh so I spent about four years as a lecturer and researcher in the space before I left to start my consultancy yeah. um and now I describe myself as having a portfol portfolio career in yeah. that sometimes I consult uh sometimes I'll do uh, contracting. So I'll be a contract change manager. I'm mm -hmm. still on the tools. Mm -hmm. um, I do keynote speaking. I write and I'm the managing director of the Agile Change Leadership Institute, which is a training and development company for change yeah. managers and leaders. Yeah. So 
I love it. That's, that's the arc. That is so great. Um, and you sounds like you're in a great spot now and having a lot of fun, which is really exciting. And from what I have seen, you know, through the work that you're putting out there, it's it's absolutely uh, information that people need to hear and understand if they are not only change management professionals, but leaders in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and and part of the you know what we talk about on this show is is being an effective leader, being an effective change leader. And some of that starts with, a lot of it starts with actually how the individual is, um, their own sense of self, their own self-awareness, mindfulness, how they present themselves through the work that you've done and the teaching and the consulting and maybe even the research. Where does, you know, how, how do you think about the importance of individuals who are stepping into that role of change manager or change leader, you know, what importance do, does really understanding the self have in the conversation? Oh, uh, I, I think it's absolutely where it starts. Yeah. And I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I kind of, there was a subtle shift in the work I was doing for a while. So for a while I was really fo focusing on change managers. Mm -hmm. And then I realized through the work that I do, you can have the best change manager in the world. You can have the best change plan. You can have the best communications, absolutely brilliant. And it will only succeed or fail based on the quality and caliber of the leader who is in front of you. Yeah. So, you know, and that, you know, from that point on, I had a much stronger focus on change leadership because mm -hmm. for me, that's the pivot point of successful change. I totally agree. Yeah. And I think, um, so in 2021, um, I wrote a book, Change Leader. Yeah. And the central thesis in that is that before you can lead change with others, you have to lead yourself through change. And so the book details what are the 33 changes you need to make as a leader uh, before you are fit for leading others through change. And, oh, you know, I, I, I am so aligned with you because if you don't know your own biases around change, um, if you don't know if you are not actively working on expanding your comfort with uncertainty and ambiguity, um, if you're not interrogating your relationship with power. Mm -hmm. So how do you get comfortable with sharing power rather than hoarding power? Mm -hmm. Because when yeah. leaders need to hoard power, that's when you've got that command and control that just doesn't right. work in this environment. Right. Yeah, we've seen that play out very much so over the past four years in particular as the world has evolved and shifted. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and what, mm. it, it, to that end though, I think there's, um, you know, if you were to, to describe what would it take for someone to go from where they're at today, you've got these 33 sort of things that they need to take a look at. Mm. But if you were to summarize it in one word, what's sort of holding mm. people back or what could propel them to that next step of being able to move forward in that way as a more effective leader, as a change leader versus change manager, um, which may be, you know, more just focused on the process and the tools and the templates and plans. Can I have two things? You can have, yes, you sure can. Can I have two <laughs> things? Because I'm thinking about what you've asked <laughs> and I was just about to answer and then, I, oh, hang on, yeah, hang no, on. Yeah. There's something more important, right? So what I was going to tell you is courage. Yeah. The courage to try new things, to be uncomfortable, for people to think differently of you. Yeah. That's right. Hard. Yep. It's courage. You've got to be brave. This, this is a risk-reward game. If you are not prepared to take the risks, you will not see the rewards, whether you are a change manager or a change leader, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But here's where I checked myself, Jessica. Okay. You can't have courage without self-compassion. I agree with that. I love that. That's a good follow-up right. word. I'm glad you shared both. I think that's right. that actually resonates a lot with me right now um, in so many ways. So yeah. Tell me more. Tell me more. Oh, flipping yes. flipping the microphone on you. Yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, I There's been some interesting, so uh, there's a, a leadership role that I have sort of stepped into willingly um, and 
you know, being a leader, you're putting your yourself on the line in many ways. You're putting forth ideas or asks that may not be popular or um, initially accepted, right? Is the whole change arc there. And you have to stand firm in your resolve sometimes or be flexible because it's not, you know, and so that's hard. And that's where this compassion comes in. So I've been sort of bumping into this leadership position that I've been put in and some of the dynamics that are playing out. And I'm like, okay, where do I, where do I stand firm and where do I be flexible? Mm-hmm. And am I screwing up along the way? I don't know. I, and that's probably, right. yeah, a hundred percent. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> I, that's what I'm, you know, I, so that's what makes it for me. It's we can lead in different forums of yeah. our lives and in some forums it's easier than others. Um, for a lot of different reasons, but yeah. Mm. What's, mm. what kind of made you bring those two, two words together? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I thank you for sharing that because sometimes when we talk about this, it gets really abstract and theoretical, but that is the perfect example of, of what happens. So for me, this, you know, this introduced the concept of shame in the work yeah. that we do and, and the power of shame in holding back change. Mm. We rarely talk about shame um in organizational life we don't like talking about it in personal life but shame is that experience we have when we start asking ourselves questions am I loved am I worthy am I relevant which are all the questions that are coming up for you as you're bumping into these decisions are are people going to like me if I make this decision you know is it the right decision am I relevant as a as a leader of change you know and and so as shame starts putting its little tendrils out yep whenever we are in a state of cha- shame we slow down or we're paralyzed right. we won't do things yeah. right so we yeah. won't change when we're in a state of shame mm-hmm. and the only antidote to shame is self-compassion mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. more you can care for yourself you can love yourself you can go easy on yourself you give yourself the benefit of the doubt yeah that's what gives you movement that's what creates change and what happens for people a lot of people in our space as leaders of change is that they start to go into a shame spiral right and it amplifies right so once you're in a shame spiral that triggers the amygdala hijack your fight Mm -hmm. flight freeze and what does that look like in the workplace well Fight is yeah. Yeah, yeah. aggressive, aggressive yeah. people around you. Yeah. Flight, I'm checking out. I'm not even, I'm completely disengaging with yeah. this. Yeah. Freeze. Paralysis. I don't know what to do. So this is where, yes, it takes courage, but you've got to have that foundation of self-compassion, know how to be really kind to yourself as a leader of change and as a recipient of change. Yeah. To be able to keep moving. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and not only is shame not talked about a lot in the organization, but neither is compassion, self-compassion, mm-hmm. compassion for others. I mm-hmm. think that's, you know, that would be as part of maybe the training that we provide. And I know you you do uh, with your training to our change leaders is let's start to have those conversations and bring that into the fold of organizational culture and thinking because we're missing it and it's created oh. missing it in so many areas actually politics uh, <laughs> like everything but let, let uh, us count the ways <laughs> no, <laughs> that we are missing self-compassion yeah. and compassion, and compassion um, yeah yeah and I think I think if you look at you know the the organizational values that plaster the walls right you do see more of a focus on care Right, yeah. and we value the human, which you could argue is compassion, but self-compassion, being able to check the self-talk when yeah. you're going, oh, geez, Jen, you were an idiot. You should have. That's where it <laughs> gets. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So courage is what is the um, self-compassion is an antidote. Courage is what moves us through that place of being uh, stuck, whether it's fight, flight, or freeze. How else can courage help? Um, you know, change leaders do kind of move beyond where they're currently at, like reach that next level of effectiveness or leadership. Um, yeah. About that? 
Yeah, I do have thoughts about that. And I think um, there's two things. There's two concepts with courage. So one is the concept of micro moments of courage. Uh -huh. The reason why a lot of leaders are reluctant to be really brave is because they see it as that big action, you know, the the running into the burning house, the yeah. that nature of courage. How Whereas if we can start to chunk it down and think, what is just an area that I could be a little bit more braver? Mm -hmm. um, and that bravery, and so this is the second piece, is how do I test, right? It's the test and learn. So if I want to be more courageous in a space, what's the littlest action that I could take and get feedback from, whether either it's internal feedback, how did I feel about that, uh -huh. or feedback from the people that I'm leading to say, was that effective? Yeah. Yeah. Which then bolsters my courage to do something more. Yeah. That's so a great chunk it down, test it. Yeah. That helps make it so much more manageable for people to move forward in that way. Um, it, because when it does feel overwhelming, it can also lead to that paralysis that you were mentioning mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, what are some examples of ways people could test their courage as change leaders? Would it be potentially like saying, speaking up in a meeting and putting forth an idea in a different way? Or do you have other examples that can maybe crystallize what you're, what you're describing? Yeah. yeah. Moments, micro moments so, of courage. So the example you said then was speaking up in a meeting. I don't think that's a micro moment of courage. I think that's considerable risk. Um, mm. particularly if we don't understand the psychological safety of that space. Ah, and, you know, yeah. as, as, as a, an aside, we talk a lot about psychological safety in organisations. We yeah. talk not at all about psychological safety in executive leadership teams. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yep. To be more courageous by speaking up as a leader with my peers could be fraught with all sorts of danger. Yeah. How do we chunk that down? We find that person on your leadership team that you feel the safest with mm -hmm. that might still be a bit surprised that you raised a new idea with them mm -hmm. and you have a side conversation with them or a pre-conversation with them to say, hey, here's an idea I've got. Yeah. What's your feedback on it? Yeah. Yeah. If that's a good outcome, you might then have a conversation with somebody else who doesn't know you as well, where the risk is a little bit higher, Got but it, it's still yeah. not the risk of speaking out loud in front of a whole table of peers. Got it. Yeah. That's a great, that, those are great examples to help. People so so for, for me, yeah. the technique is think about the action you really, really want to do. Mm -hmm. I, I want to speak out at my peers and then how far can you dial it back? Mm hmm. So it's still what it's still the essence of what I wanted to do, but it's just tiny. It's a tiny action that I can test. How how well does that go? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it also you know if you translate that into change, organizational change, and doing that at scale, so much of what needs to happen at the outset is that building of buy-in and creating awareness before you ever go forth with that big bold change. Right. So you're just taking it into a more of a micro view, um, which is really helpful to process. OK, here's here's where I'm at. Here's how I can be a more courageous and brave change leader. Um, mm -hmm. What a, I guess what other tips or advice would you have for people who are, um, you know, trying to level up as change leaders in whether it's, uh, you know, individually or uh something they can do in terms of skills acquisition or or kind of reframing their thinking what else would be helpful mm -hmm. to help people reach that next level yeah um i think that well again i'm going to go with a generic quality right because it feeds what they can do and that is curiosity yeah so often you find that people will be much more courageous when they are equally curious about something. Mm -hmm. So curious, curiosity seems to be this gateway to permission to be mm -hmm. courageous. And so in answer to your question, what else can leaders do? Part of it is having an active curiosity practice. Yeah. So yeah. maybe that means that every day they put 10 minutes to just stopping scanning through LinkedIn, where are there topics that they know nothing about 
and mm. reading one article. Um, being able to, you know, we talk about searchlight intelligence. So the ability to look around you, spot things, make connections that weren't there in the first place, right? So yeah. really important element of a leader of change mm -hmm. in our current environment. Mm -hmm. So maybe one of the things the leader could do is have something like a mirror board or, a, you know, an online mind map where they actually use that as a bit of a visual journal to say, hey, here's all the things that I've learnt this week, this month, and how they might connect. So be really like active. That. Yeah, really, really active and intentional about being curious about things. I yeah. think, you know, one of the things with this world that we're we're living in at the moment, mm -hmm. whether it be the, the media, the politics, the wars, the... Yeah. The everything, yeah. The everything, um, the rate of change, the volume of change in organisations. Our brains are really overwhelmed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There is no, <laughs> there is no meditation in the world that's gonna like help Surprise you. Well, that's you not true. Yeah. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. I'm. I have a meditation practice. I adore my meditation practice. But I think you know that notion of medicinal meditation, where you're trying to meditate to keep calm with everything that's going on, yeah. is a little yeah. bit flawed. Um. And so I think you know, with that, a lot of the things that we would have taken for granted ten years ago, pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. um, pre-craziness in politics and geopolitics and stuff like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um our brains were much better equipped to be empathetic to be curious um to be open to new ideas mm -hmm. and i think what you'll find with this onslaught of information and often very stressful information that's yeah, coming at us is. yeah is that you know, our neural pathways to empathy, they're more difficult to make. So we have to be intentional about being empathetic. You know, you look around and you see how the conversations have devolved into these binary um, right. positions, right? Yeah. And, and the, the adversarialness. They're people whose brains do not have a well-developed neural pathway with empathy. Empathy is not lighting up in those brains. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they're sociopaths. It literally means that the brain has been overwhelmed and exhausted. And so this is why I say we, we have to be intentional about being curious. We have to be intentional as leaders. We mm -hmm. have to be intentional about being, you know, deploying empathy, of being curious um, of being back to your point and where you start being aware of ourselves mm -hmm. to be a better leader because a lot of things are stacked against us at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. That's really wonderful um, advice and way of thinking about it. And would it, you know, as the leader goes through this process, is it appropriate for them to encourage similar behaviors within their team and sort of lead the way or kind of coming back to that, take small risks, what can we do here? Because that might be too bold. What could a change leader who's on that path of developing curiosity and self-compassion and awareness and courage, how can they, you know, is it just be the change you want to see in the world or is it <laughs> more they can do to enable their teams? Yeah, I, um, again, I have multiple thoughts in one mouth on this one. So <laughs> let, let me think about it. Okay. Um, my foundation position is change is everybody's business, yep. right? And that if as a leader you were to assist others in your team to build curiosity, to build empathy, um, to build courage, you know, that's really what we call the agile mindset. So the elements mm -hmm. of, of having a really agile mindset mm -hmm. is an incredible gift, Right, because they are that that's attributes that are going to benefit their team members oh, yeah. inside and outside yeah. of the organization. Right. Right. The agile mindset is, you know, doesn't matter what role you are in. Where I think I was pausing is this notion of power mm -hmm. and equity. 
Mm-hmm. I can, yeah. So I think, um, yes, changes everybody's business, but accountability for change stays with the leader. Mm-hmm. And while, while I think that there is power in um, distributed leadership, you know, and decision-making at the coalface, yeah. you know, the people who know the most about the activity should be making the decisions, not the leader. Right. The accountability must stay with the leader. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think that's the bit that gives me a little bit pause on how I respond to your question yeah, is I would hate to see that weaponized. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. And as you were describing that too, it got me thinking, you can't force that, you know, force those types of principles or philosophies or on anybody, right. They almost have to be in the mindset to want to explore that type of leadership and to your point, someone does need to be accountable ultimately. And that makes sense to have the, the leader of the team or the organization or whatever construct it's in. So I, I, the, I, rec- I, what you're saying resonates with me. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, any final thoughts that you would like to impart on listeners of the Change Leader Insights podcast about maybe the future of change leadership or where you'd like to see beyond mm-hmm you know, building courage and and inspiring people to take action in that way. Anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap up? Oh, um, gosh, there's so much. But I think part of this is about how do we future-proof ourselves as leaders, as leaders right? Yeah. Um, now, I naturally have a bent towards agility. I think agility is a space, whether we are talking big A or small A agility, is really critical to the frontier of our practice. Um, I think for leaders, the space of agility offers so many tools and approaches to navigating uncertain futures. Um, And so if I was to encourage listeners um, to do one thing you know maybe it's a kind of a combination of what we've talked about today set up a mirror board start recording you know a bit of learning agility let's start recording topics that you find are interesting capture new facts new blog posts you want to follow that you know that kind of thing yeah Um, but maybe set up a set of experiments for yourself where do you want to be more braver yeah I like that what are your self-compassion practices? Maybe we take this whole podcast and yeah. say, set up a mirror board. <laughs> this is, you know, create a canvas. This is what yep. we've covered. What are you actually going to do? But that's the important thing, Jessica. It's about taking action, not that's just right. listening. That's right. That is the key takeaway um, to actually do something. And it can be a very small something that gets you further or closer and closer to where you want to be. So great advice, great wisdom. Thank you so much, Jen, for being on the show. I'm so delighted that we had a chance to connect and talk. Um, Absolutely. Where can people find you, find uh, more information about the work that you're doing? Uh, Feel free to check the website, any information there. Yeah, absolutely. And look, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been such a good chat. It's uh, for the listeners, it's currently uh, early morning in Melbourne, Australia. So nothing like a conversation like this to actually (laughs) fire you up for the day. It's Friday here at the end of the week. Um, I um, always welcome connections on LinkedIn, people. That's probably the easiest place to connect with me is on LinkedIn. Um, And uh, I think, yeah, so we... We do share content and blog posts on the Agile Change Leadership Institute. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they're probably the two places, the, the website aclinstitute.com um, okay. and LinkedIn makes it the easiest way for people yes. to reach can, out. Can they buy your books on Amazon? If they want of to? course they can yeah. buy the books okay. on um, Amazon. <laughs> the, the, and it, it, it's an interesting thing. Um, so they can buy the books from our shop on the website or okay. Amazon. Okay. 
Um, we have no control over Amazon's pricing. They have been doing oh. the stupidest things. Mm. So price check. You... you may find it cheaper on our website okay. with international postage. <laughs> all right. All right. Be sure to check that. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to keeping in touch and continuing to learn from you. And I hope you enjoy your Friday. Um, yeah, we'll do. I'm wrapping up my Thursday. So we'll see where the night takes me. But yeah, thanks again for being on the show. Pleasure.